Do you feel powerless, unseen, unheard, unvalued? Are you living an inauthentic life driven by the expectations and demands of others? A life dictated by your past, your wounds, your scars? Well, it's time to break free. Join Ellie Sheffy and her special guests as they guide you on a journey to leave the chains of your past behind and step into a life of your own design. Welcome to You Are Not Your Scars. Here is your host, Ellie. Hello and welcome. Today's guest is the founder and CEO of Veritas Ventures, a strategic advisory firm for innovation, technology, and digital transformation. Committed to impact and innovation, she is a member of the expert group on digital platforms and ecosystems for the World Economic Forum, an innovation expert at the United Nations, and a responsible leader at the BMW Foundation. She is also a joint venture partner with the Founder Institute and serves as their GCC advisor. A dedicated philanthropist and mentor, she sits on the advisory board of the IBM Village Capital Accelerator and is a mentor with Techstars, Respond, E7, and many other global accelerators and incubators. She is a global ambassador at Vital Voices and part of the VV100, the Vital Voices Network of 100 Top Influential Women, an impassioned advocate for women empowerment and specifically for women in venture capital and technology, please welcome Vera Fudorjanski. Now, Vera, you have had quite an international life. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. First of all, Ellie, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and it's good to see you again. I wish we would be live in the studio with you right now, but we have to do this online. So it was an international upbringing indeed. I have several nationalities in my closest family. My dad is Russian-Ukrainian. My mom is German-French. I grew up in Germany, uh, was born in what is now Kazakhstan, went to high school in the U.S., to university in the U.K., also studied in New Zealand, well, really lived in 10 different countries. I'm living in the UAE right now, and it's my 10th country to live in. And I think, you know, this being an immigrant child, but also having lived in so many different places really formed me as a person and formed a lot of my values and my views on the world. Absolutely. So when you are living such an international life, you're seeing so many perspectives and cultures and historical influences, cultural influences, the food, the all of the different things. I mean, I can only imagine that that really imprints and informs your global perspective as you go forward. So what do you say was the biggest impact that this global life has had on your framework and your perspective? It's a really good question. Well, I think I will start with what was the scariest thing I've ever done. And one of the most scariest things was when I was 17 years old, I received a scholarship to go to high school in the U.S. And it was pre-WhatsApp and pre-Skype. So there wasn't really a way or pre-Instagram. There wasn't really a way to keep in touch with my family. And I remember obviously saying yes to that uh, scholarship. It was the German, like the U.S. Senate and the German equivalent to that that invited me to go and I couldn't choose where to go. I was sent to what they believed was the real American family. And it was a family in West Texas, in Odessa, Texas. I actually went to Perman High School. If anybody knows Friday Night Lights, the show, that's actually about the high school I went to. And I loved it. It was amazing, but it was so scary as a 17 year old girl to leave Germany and to leave my home, my parents and go into the unknown completely to really get on that plane, arrive and be part of a new, you know, American family, a new language, new ways. And it was so scary. I mean, I really remember my first day. I was even, you know, I was afraid. I was, I felt uncomfortable to even open the fridge and eat something. I remember I was starving the first few days just because I was, you know, so not, you know, well, really um, not feeling comfortable, but that shaped so much of my views of also building trust, building self-confidence, opening up to cultures. Before that, I always wanted to become a lawyer. But back then, being a lawyer would have tied me very much to Germany. So I would have to study German law. After spending that year in the United States, the senior year and graduating from the high school in the US, I realized I do not want to be tied to one country. I really want to have 
you know, and ex- the experience of living in different cultures, uh, getting to know people from all different paths of life and bring those different cultures together. So that really became a passion, which I still carry nowadays. And I, I'll speak about what I do later on. But it really, you know, that experience as a 17 year old girl going to the United States uh, to do my senior year influenced a lot of what happened through all my life, you know, for the next how many years has it been like 20, 30 years since. So not everyone is as fortunate to have really supportive families, but I love the point that you made that you can have a chosen family as well. And I love that you are so connected on a WhatsApp group. So that's an amazing takeaway that people can implement if they're yearning for that connection and that support and that encouragement and that community that you're able to get with your family. I love that, you know, you can, friends can become family and you can connect on your WhatsApp group. So beyond your family, who are some of the people that you turn to most? Who are your role models? Yes. Well, very good question. Obviously there are some women that are, have made amazing careers and I look up to them, but I must say my role model really is my grandma. In fact, both of my grandmothers, one of them unfortunately passed away. One is still alive and they are my grandmothers. I grew up with my grandmother. My parents had me very young. So my mother, both my parents were still studying at university when I was born. So my grandmother really, you know, raised me. And that's why I learned the strong family structures from the very early age and the strong family bond. You know, like I mentioned in the beginning, we moved to Germany. So I'm an, I'm an immigrant child. And what I saw from my grandmother, my mother's mother, when we moved, uh, she used to work for the local government in the city we used to live in. And I remember her as this, you know, very sophisticated woman, of always very beautiful dress, with a lot of beautiful jewelry. As a child, I remember going through the jewelry box. It was like my favorite thing to do uh, when I was visiting her. And then suddenly, you know, we moved to Germany and my grandma, she did not hesitate to start over. Now, she had to leave everything behind. We pretty much left overnight and immigrated to Germany. And from going from that very high position of working for the government, she uh, went to work in an elderly home and she started cleaning and washing elderly you know, people who couldn't uh, take care of themselves anymore. And that is such a big example for me in my life that she did not, you know, she was not attached to her ego. She was not afraid to start over and she was not afraid, you know, um, she was not defined by the outside circumstances. She said, I need to start over. This is my new life now. I do not have that life anymore. We had to leave everything behind because we pretty much left overnight. We packed, uh, I remember, we packed our piano and our books in a container and we left. And she started over. And that gave me so much courage in my life that whatever happens to me, I am, you know, I'm not afraid. I'm ready to take risks because I've seen that people can start over again and it can become successful again as long as you have this, you know, strong family bond around you. What a powerful example that your grandmother set for you. What a powerful example that was of strength and resiliency and grace and tenacity and focus and drive. I love that you mentioned that she wasn't tied to her ego. She wasn't tied to her possessions or her previous position that she said, well, this is where I am. This is my new life. And she dove right in. That is incredibly powerful and inspiring. And I think so many can relate to that. So I can definitely see why your grandmother would be such a role model for you. Now, what's the best advice that she ever gave you? Well, there's so much, you know, every time I speak to my grandmother, there's so much wisdom, but I think one of the most important things, even if she didn't say it explicitly, but I think what I took away is not to be afraid to start over again and to really take risks in life and potentially also, you know, never become comfortable. In general, I realize in my life, whenever it gets comfortable, I get a little bit unease and I move into new challenges, which sometimes I ask myself, why do I need to create new challenges around me all the time? But I think it's because I learned from looking at my family that the moment you get comfortable, you just stop learning, you stop growing. So I always push myself outside of my comfort zone. And I think I learned that from my grandparents. 
I love that. Now, what's something that you wish she would have told you that you had to learn the hard way? I think I wish I would have learned earlier to trust my intuition more, to really trust my inner voice. It took me a long time to fully trust myself. And I think I'm still in this learning process because sometimes, even though my gut tells me one thing, my brain starts telling me another thing. And I feel especially, you know, we women, we have such a strong intuition. And I, I wish I would have listening to it earlier, even in my, in my life. So when your intuition tells you one thing and your head tells you something else, how do you navigate that? How do you silence the concerns or the thoughts that are coming up in your head and really tap into your intuition and then follow through on that? Well, a lot of that is going to my daily rituals. You know, I meditate every day. I do, you know, mantra chanting. I do certain visualization processes. And I think that really helps me to find this quietude and to listen to my inner voice. In fact, I really, and I have, you know, a lot of younger women founders ask me how to, you know, what advice I would give them. And I always say, you know, among many other things, it's important to find a space where you can really listen and hear your own voice because there's so much noise in the world. We're constantly bombarded, especially in this digital world we live in. You constantly have so much and you have all those you know, influences that show you a certain life you could have. But it's so difficult for a young woman to understand that this life is not even real. A real life is something completely different. So to find that space, whatever it means, you have to try many different things. For some people, it could be cooking. For other people, it's yoga. For other people, it's running or, you know, walking or swimming. For me, it's really, uh, it's processes as well. It used to be yoga. Now it's much more qigong and meditation and mantra chanting. So there are different phases in life as well. And I think it's really important to take, to make that space and time for yourself to find this calmness that you really can listen to what is it that I really want? Besides the daily rituals, which is really important, you know, to define for yourself, because like I was saying, it can change over time. It can be different depending on, you know, the stage of your life, where you're at. One other important thing also is to define what your values, what your values are. It helps you in life. It helps, you know, setting boundaries. It helps to, you know, live in alignment with your values. And I think this is a really important thing to then also realize and being able to differentiate what is really my voice inside of me talking and what is potentially the noise from the outside. So, yes, I mean, it's part of building, building really this resilient mindset. The daily rituals, knowing your values, setting boundaries is another important one. You know, I used to think I can help everyone. And that's why that was the reason why I burned out last year, because I tried to help especially female founders. And it's not really scalable because, I mean, you only have that much amount of time in your life. But setting boundaries is a really important one. So knowing your values, setting boundaries, listening to your own voice. I think those are all important things, but we all learn them with time. I didn't know that when I was 20 years old and I, you know, I wish I would have, but I think it's a typical process we all go through that we learn over time to, you know, discover ourselves and to, uh, yeah, to really reach a certain point where we maybe, you know, feel more calm so we can listen to, uh, to our inner voice. And in my case, for example, I take time to go on retreats where I can completely switch off. I try to go offline, I turn off my phone, you know, just because it's constantly, you know, reminding me of so many emails and messages I have to answer. So I turn it off and I take time for myself. And I know this potentially is not possible for everyone. We can't just, not everybody can take time off and go away for a week to, you know, Costa Rica or or Mexico or Bali. But Potentially, this time can be created in, you know, during the week, just, you know, take a couple of hours and really set them aside for yourself. I think self-care is really, really important. And by creating that space and time for self-care is how we can get in touch more with our, you know, feeling, intuition and that inner voice that many times we, we don't hear just because we're so busy with other things. Absolutely. I think that's so important to take the time to get still so that you can be present and you can listen. And I love the tips that you just shared for people to be able to do that, to develop that strong routine, to set aside some time within their day if they can't get away that is just for themselves. 
to carve out their boundaries and reflect on their values and to really prioritize what's important to them, their dreams, their hopes. All of those things are really powerful practices that the audience can implement. So thank you so much for sharing that. Now, you've talked a little bit about moving to the U.S., accepting that scholarship as being one of the scariest things that you've done. And you've talked about your practice for clarity, your practice for centering, your practice for self-care. Now, how do you overcome the fear, the doubt that can creep up from time to time? Well, (laughs) You know, I still am afraid of so many things. In fact, I'm starting a new project right now and I'm afraid, you know, what if it fails? But if I don't try it, if I don't build it, it's much worse than actually having the fear. And in fact, I feel the fear is much stronger as long as you think about it. The moment you take action, fear almost disappears because you're already on the way you're doing it. It's scarier to think about it before you actually have taken action, I realized. So I am all for doing the things that scare you and really, you know, like I was saying before, get, getting out of the comfort zone. And I've done it many times in my life, you know, where I just, even though I was really comfortable, but I would get out of the comfort zone. In fact, another scary thing that, you know, I've, I think is really important to do and I've done many times and it potentially also led me into, you know, more difficult situations in my life, but because it aligns with my values, I find it's important to speak up in controversial controversial situations. If you feel that something is not right, be it in your work or be it in, you know, certain circumstances, I think it's really important to speak up when you see injustice happening. And that, you know, that I'm pushing myself to speak up, that I'm pushing myself into scary situations has formed me quite a bit. And I would not, I wouldn't change it, even though, you know, potentially uh, I could have an easier and more comfortable life without uh, pushing myself to those limits. But I think we only live once. And if we don't go, you know, all the way, don't speak up about this right. And, you know, I, in my case, at least when I, you know, reach my whatever age it will be, hopefully, you know, I'm all about longevity. Hopefully it will be a a very old, you know, healthy age. But uh, when I'm about to leave, you know, this earth, I really want to look back and say, I spoke up when I should have, and I have led a life and taking risks and taking risks, you know, only he wants. So I, uh, you know, I find we should be taking more risks in life because what's the worst that can happen? It won't work out. Okay. We might fail, but you know, it's better to fail than not to do it at all. Absolutely. So what has been something that you tried and it didn't go as planned? And how did you navigate that and deal with the uh, disappointment? You know, I think the most important thing to deal with disappointment is to have the support network, you know, to deal with failures, to deal with really difficult situations in life is to have your support network and your tribe around it. And that goes back, you know, to my family that I have around me, but it also goes to, you know, certain friends I have around me as well. And that network really, it's almost, they pick you up again. You feel help. You feel like you can't really, you can't fall all the way to the bottom. And even if you do, you know, that's like, you can't go further down. The only way up, back is up again. So it's been, it's been many things, you not know, professionally, personally, lots of disappointments in life. I must say, I trust people very quickly and easily. And I think it's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because I built relationships very easily and quickly with all kinds of people from all different walks in life and countries because I've lived in so many. So building, you know, relationships and networks is easy for me, but it also a little bit of a curse because I just open up and trust people so much. So I need to, you know, do what I preach myself and find quiet time and actually listen within and realize, is this now the right relationship to invest into or not? But yeah, I mean, there've been many disappointments in life professionally and personally, but I think the most important is really that support network around me that I have that I'm very grateful for. And it's difficult to build, you know, I'm, I might be anticipating your next, next question is how do you actually build such a network? That's it's exactly time. right. I mean, it's not easy. And especially for people who don't have the family support or the family structures. So I love that you're going there because that's exactly what I really want to talk about is 
how can you create these communities? How can you collaborate? How can you build these networks both personally and professionally? It's a very good question. And I think it's really important to talk about it because many times we say, you know, build your tribe. And I hear that also as a slogan, you know, on Instagram, hey, build your tribe. But how do you actually build your tribe, right? It is not easy. So I think it's time, you know, investing time in the right people. And who are the right people? It's the people who share your values. You know, people who are aligned with the values you have. And that goes back to define what your values are. So who are the people that share your values? Who are the people who, you know, lift you up? What do you feel inspired? You know, really energetically, we feel that sometimes we just don't realize because we're busy with other things. But if you really feel, you can feel the energy of the other person. Who are the people that feel, make you feel alive, that you feel so inspired? You want to go and change the world because they are changing the world, right? You want to be part of this movement. I think it's important to surround yourself with more people like that and, Of course, now during COVID times and travel restrictions, it's not so easy to physically be there, but even online, you know, to just be part of communities like that, find your, um, you know, people who, who align with you. I think that's, that's really the most important. And where do you, I find also the sense of belonging is really important. Where do you have the sense of belonging? It's, of course, family, but it's also friends of yours that make you feel that you belong. And as a result of this, and I think going back from, you know, stepping for the first time to, into, you know, the United States as a young girl and realizing I want to create this, something that will bring different cultures together. And over the next, how many years has it been? Like 20 years To the point right now, what I'm doing is I'm building a community for women, a safe space really, where women, and I'm aiming at powerful women who always give, you know, usually they are the role models, the mentors, the inspiring, strong women. I'd like to build a community for them, like a peer-to-peer community where this women actually receive again. Because, you know, in order to be able to give, you need to receive as well. You need to fill your cup, you know, in order to to give more. So what I'm building right now is a network a community for women where they have the safe space, where I create experiences for them, where I help more women to get on boards, on C-level positions, where we really create also an educational process for women, where they learn how to invest in startups, how to buy NFTs, what is Web3, what is Metaverse, how can we diversify our wealth? You know, men talk about investments much more. I think recently I had a meeting, in fact, in 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 Riyadh and Saudi Arabia, that technology conference, there was somebody saying that men speak about investment opportunities in like 50 something percent of the conversations. Whereas we women, it might be five to 10%. And I want to change that. I'd like women to speak more about investment opportunities. So we talk about what have you invested in? Or have you bought this NFT? How can we create more wealth for women, diversify that wealth and support each other? You know, so I'm all for getting more funding, you know, for young women that we have more female VCs, which is really important because you usually invest in, you know, in somebody you relate to. How can we bring women, more women in the whole NFT and crypto space? So I really want to create that community of women where you can ask questions without feeling that somebody's going to judge you, where you can have that safe space, no matter what it is, what kind of questions you want to ask, not just diversifying the wealth, but really anything that you're going through professionally or personally. I think that's really important. And why I'm building this, because first of all, I want to bring different cultures together. I want to bring American, you know, German, Saudi, South African women together for them to realize we're much more alike than we're different. Because I've sat with all those different kinds of women together and really we are much more alike than we're different. And I'd love for more women to share this, this perspective and this feeling. You're definitely passionate about creating this network, and I love it. I think it is so, so necessary right now. What is the genesis of that passion? Well, you know, Ellie, I've also gone, I mean, now I'm very optimistic here, and optimism is definitely one of my core values in my life. It goes back to, you know, taking risks, stepping into the unknown, really being able to start over. But I've had my, you know, good share of difficulties in my life as well. And one of them has been that I was in a situation where I had nobody to talk to because of certain things that were happening, uh, you know, at work. And I just don't want other women to be in that situation. I really want to be able for them to have a space where they can go to and talk to other women, where they can find support. 
So it's not just the bringing cultures together, which is great, but I also really want to have women, you know, to, for women to have a the support network that they potentially might not have. And especially those strong women who w- work very high up. Many times we know it gets very lonely at the top. So I want to create a sense of belonging community, almost a family for them. So you've talked a lot about that fire in your belly to use your voice and to speak up. Where did that come from? Well, you know, one of the times was when I was part of a certain group of people that were not treated right or fairly. And I thought it was just me. But when I found out that other women were also part of this, I felt I have to speak up. And I remember talking to somebody and to a colleague at work, and she said, somebody will do it. And I said, but well, I have to be that somebody. So I spoke up because we can't rely on others to speak up. I had to take, you know, all my courage. And I knew that this could lead to losing the job, but I just felt it is the right thing to do. If it wouldn't have been just for myself, I probably wouldn't have spoken up. But because I saw that other people were involved as well and other lives were affected, I felt it was the right thing to to do. And uh, looking backwards, I feel it was the right thing. And even if it would have been just for myself, it is important to speak up. And we have to be those somebodies because it's up to us to do the right thing. Yeah. So I love that sentiment. That is such a powerful sentiment. I have to be that somebody. I have to be that somebody. We can't wait for somebody else to speak up We can't wait for someone else to be the change. We can't wait for someone else to do the thing that we want. Exactly. Yeah. Be the change you want to see, as they say. Yeah. Be the change you want to see. Use your voice. It is your vessel for change. It is such a powerful thing. And when, as uncomfortable as it is, there's a freedom that comes When you use your voice, when you speak your truth, when you speak your boundaries, when you ask for what you need, there's a freedom that comes with using your voice. Exactly. One of the, I don't want to say universal, but something that is so prevalent, you know, something that is so, so prevalent amongst women and especially women who are founders, women who are C-suite executives, women who are in traditionally male dominated areas, tech, innovation, VC, far too often their ideas are discounted. Their voice is not heard. They can be in a meeting and others will speak right over them. They have an idea and it gets, oh no, no, that won't work. And they're disrespected, unseen, unheard. Being able to navigate that, whether that's journaling, whether that's creating your own opportunity, if there isn't one, whether that's starting your own side business while you're still working your current job, Yeah. You're so right. Unfortunately, there are so many instances where women are not heard. And I've been in the technology space now for almost a decade, having started as the founder myself, then been an ecosystem builder, launching accelerators in in the Middle East, which is also not a very easy potentially part of the world to navigate in, then becoming a venture, joining a VC fund. And now I'm going back to being, you know, a founder myself, building that network, but also being part of the VC. And I think important for me in my case to be continue being part of the venture capital space is because we need more women on this side of the table. Mm-hmm. You know, unfortunately, the statistics are horrible. Only two, two percent of all the VC investments have gone to female led startups. Two percent. I mean, this is just like, it's a shocking number. And I want to contribute, you know, to changing that. And in order to change that, we need more women on the other side of the table. We need more women as investors. I'm part of the movement called Female Angels in Dubai, where we want to create more female angels by end of this year, just because the more women we have on the investor side, the more women will get funding, you know. And I I think it's important, but it's also important to emphasize it's about impact. You know, it's not about just gender, I 
want to invest in you know, qualified men as well. But statistics are that less women get funding because, you know, potentially it's connected to the fact that more men are investors. I am an LP, a limited partner in a venture capital fund in Africa. And out of the, I think, almost 200 limited partners they have, there are only nine that are women. Wow. Only just nine because, out of 200? Can you imagine? Just because also many women think this is so out of reach that they think being a limited partner in the VC fund must be so complicated and it's so difficult, but actually it's not. And it's great to learn that side as well. I've been a VC myself now, wanted to learn what does it mean to actually be an investor in a venture capital fund. So I think as a woman, and that's why, you know, it goes back to the fact that I, I continue learning uh, always. And I think something I would like for women watching this or for anybody watching this take away is to continue being curious. I think being curious, wanting to learn, wanting to grow, and also realizing this should not be just, you know, for a certain gender. This should be open to any gender. You know, I can be a limited partner in a VC fund. I can be an investor. I can be an angel investor. I can, you know, speak up at this table just because my voice should be heard, no matter whether I'm a woman or a man. If I believe in this and I truly believe and I can make a difference, yes, yeah, speak up. You know, don't hold, don't hold back because, and I mean, I've been in a situation many times as well. I was afraid to say something at the table because I felt... I don't have anything valuable to say, but then I would hear somebody else saying exactly what I was thinking of. And I would regret, I'm like, why did I not say this? Because it was exactly what I thought, that we just, we don't trust ourselves. And I think what's really important is to build the self-trust. Very difficult. I'm also still working on it. I have my days, so I have a lot of doubts. But then, and I'm circling back to the support network, I think that's really important. You know, to have people, when you feel really down, who do I call? Do I call my brother? Do I call my parents? Do I call my grandma? Do I have a girlfriend who just say, hey, come on, you know, don't forget. It's about, you know, fixing each other crowns, like we say. So who is that person in your life who's going to tell you, hey, of course it's okay to have days that we feel down. And it's fine. And it's also important to let this happen, to really be in those emotions as well. But then, you know, say, okay, this was enough. Now, come on, let, let's do this. We can. And I mean, obviously it's easy to now say, yeah, we can do anything, but I have, you know, even building this network, I'm afraid I have my doubts as well, but I truly believe that it is very much my passion, but I also want women to have the safe space because when I needed it, it wasn't there. So I want to build something that will impact women and not just the women who will be part of my network, but also their husbands and their children and their girlfriends and the wider circle and if I can achieve that, honestly, then I, I can, you know, say that I created an impact in this world and I'll be, you know, happy. But it's, it's a long way to go still because building such a network, it takes time. Building networks in general takes time. You know, it takes, it's part of building trust, you know, to be able to be vulnerable, to open up, you know, to other people. It's just, it takes time. So uh, things, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Yeah. So <laughs> one step at a time, right? I, you mentioned earlier good, good, good. <laughs> that when you take that action, when you take that first action and then the next and then the next to just dive in and take the fearful, messy, uncomfortable action, because what's the worst thing that can happen? It doesn't work. And then you try something else. So I love that you're essentially saying, feel the fear and do it anyway, just get out there and take that action and then continue taking action until this bigger vision unfolds. I love that. Exactly. Very tough, but if you have the right people around you, it's doable. And, you know, to your point earlier, some people might not have the right people around uh, around oneself and it's very much possible. So maybe it's, you know, watching certain TED Talks or, you know, reading about certain people, you know, getting inspiration, potentially setting goals and say, I'd like to get to this. How do I get there? Who are the people I should reach out to that could help me, you know, get to this goal? So really have a clear vision. I think that could be a really like a, one of the actionable items to set a goal and say, what are the little milestones that I need in order to get there. Who are the people who can help me along the way? And also ask for help. You know, I think we women would tend not to ask for help because we, you know, just carry so much on our shoulders. But who says that we have to carry all that weight on our shoulders ourselves, right? It's really important to to be able to ask for help as well. But, you know, a guilty as charged here myself, I hardly ever ask for help myself. And, you know, it's it's a lot of what I'm saying I need to still do myself too. But, you know, it's, it's a... <laughs> 
it's a practice, right? step. It's, it's a practice. We're on this journey of this beautiful thing called life. And so, so many of these things we learn along the way and then have to develop that muscle. So yeah. I think as women, we are conditioned from a young age not to ask for help. We're conditioned from a young age not to speak up. We're conditioned from a young age to do everything for everyone else, to be everything for everyone else, to somehow save the world. And so I love that throughout our time so far today, you have shared self-care practices. You have shared prioritization practices for yourself and vision and clarity and impact and inspiration and all the things that you need to find that power within you to use your voice to speak up, whether that's speaking up for justice, for speaking up against injustice, for speaking up for an idea that you have, or for speaking up and asking for the help that you need. You mentioned Rome wasn't built in a day. Rome also wasn't built by one person. So I love that it all ties together with this safe, empowered community that you're building. Where it really is a safe space to speak up and to ask for what you need. Community is so important. It's becoming even more important with Web3. It's probably a whole other conversation, but you know, Web3 is all about building community and building people around you who are not just watching what you're doing, but who are really supporting you. And I think that's the big difference where the world is moving into right now. You know, your followers on Instagram or Twitter, they know what you're doing, but they're not really invested into you. And I think that's a big difference from going from being a fan to being almost an investor in you. And this is what I'd like, you know, to contribute, that we create a community where people who are in this community, they really want you to succeed. I think that's a great distinction that you brought up. So your followers, your social media followers, the people in the great greater community, they follow you, but they don't invest in you. No, that's a big difference, you know, where they have, they follow you, they know what you're up to, but they're not, don't, they're not necessarily your supporters. And what I would like to create is a community of supporters, a community of like-minded who really, you know, care about each other, who want to support, who want to share best practices, you know. And like I said before, it can be different for different people. I'm very spiritual. So for me, that spiritual part is very important. Some people, it might be cooking, dancing, you know, or hiking, but it's important to find that that community, that support group, that support network that helps you overcome you know, fears, doubts, or whatever it is that you need to overcome in your life and to really, uh, yeah, you know, make, make the most, really use your full potential that you have in this life. And we all came here with a gift, right? Everybody has a gift. And, and it's important to share that gift as well and not to, to let the world really see, see you know, your, your light and, yeah. Yeah, your light and your impact, right? And your impact. Absolutely. So let's imagine that you have come to the end of your life best lived. You have left it all on the table. You have used your voice. You have built this incredible global community. You have mentored and supported. You have nurtured. You've left it all on the field. What do you want them to say about you? Well, I would like for people to remember me for the impact I created in their lives, you know, for the inspiration they had. I have a lot of young women who come to me and say they are inspired and especially they're inspired. Actually, let me share this example with you. I was speaking at a technology conference. It's probably been two years because it was a physical conference pre-COVID. And a young woman came to me and she said, Vera, I'm an, I'm a startup founder thanks to you. And I said, how so? And she said, a few years ago, I saw you speaking on stage and you were wearing a dress. And I realized I can be in technology and can stay feminine. And that was a very you know, defining and beautiful moment that I was able to, you know, subconsciously, like not knowing, but I was able to guide this woman to her fullest potential because she saw me as a role model there and that she can be, she can stay feminine and be in technology, which is a very male dominated field. And how did that feel? How did it feel to know that by you showing up as the full embodiment of you and being you, sharing your gift, standing in your power, 
your beautiful, divine, feminine power in this male-dominated space at this tech conference. How did it feel to hear that you had been a role model to her and you had changed her life because she was able to see herself in you? Honestly, I felt gratitude. I felt grateful to her for sharing that with me. I felt probably even grateful to myself, you know, that I did not become somebody else just to fit in. So to really continue being myself, even if it's tough, even if it's mean, you know, if it means losing your job, even if it means, you know, not not having the comfortable life, but to really staying true to to yourself, I think is really important. So it's empowering. It's a lot of gratitude. Yeah, it, it gives meaning. I really felt, you know, it was, it's a life worth living when you know you inspire other people to do what they previously thought potentially they can't do just because they haven't seen somebody like you in that space. So um, I, I think the more women would be themselves and really just show the beautiful you know, strength and uh, empowerment and femininity, I think the world, and I think the world is becoming that place as well. I see a lot of change happening in the world in that respect. At my funeral, whenever it happens one day, I'd like people to come together, drink champagne, you know, dance, and then speak to each other and say, oh, very introduced us back then. This is how we met. I want them, and throughout my life, having made friends, I want women, whenever I build this network, to go away not saying I made a business connection, but going away saying I made a friend today. I'd love to have a lot of friends at my funeral who are whose life I have impacted truly, and, and that will be a life worth living. If people remember me by having made friends because I introduced them, because they've been part of you know certain moments of my life and... And they became friends. Yeah, I'd love, I love I'd love that. to be able. I obviously won't see that, but I'd love this to happen, that people will remember me because they they made truly beautiful friendships with either my community, my network, or throughout my life. I'd like to be remembered for that. So beautiful. And so it is. So how can people contact you? How can they get in touch with you? How can they learn more about the different things that you're doing and about the community that you're building? So the community is still in the making. I hope to launch in a couple of months and I will definitely share more information once it's launched. Otherwise, I am on LinkedIn. I am on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. My website is veritasventures.co. I, yeah, please, um, I, I'm always, you know, happy to meet more inspiring, amazing people from all over the world. And I'm sure people who are watching your show are some of the most inspiring and amazing people. So thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Before we sign off today, any parting words you'd like to share with the audience? I think it would be going back to what I was saying before of not being afraid to take risks in life and to be, uh, you know, to be open to fail and to really believe truly in oneself, but also believe in the universe. I very much believe in the universe as well and in the serendipity of events that take place to be at the right place at the right time and just trust that the universe has you back and just trust, you know, in your own capabilities as well, that no matter what happens, no matter how far you fall, you can always get back up because you have the strong abilities and capabilities. So really trust, trust yourself more and take risks. You can do this. <laughs> trust yourself more, take risks. The biggest, most important takeaways I'd like for you to remember from this is speak up, take risks, and don't be afraid to start over. You can do this. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. You can do this. You can do this. I love that. Use your voice, take risks. Don't be afraid to start over. And remember, you can do this. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. I know you are coming in fresh off of speaking at the conferences and that now you have just landed back in Germany. So thank you so much for taking this time to be with us here today. We appreciate it. 
Thank you so much for having me, Ellen. It's really wonderful to see you again. And I hope we'll meet in person again soon. Likewise. Thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Are Not Your Scars. Be sure to implement the tools and strategies shared today as you create a limitless life. Know that you are worthy, you are resilient, you are unbreakable, and you are unstoppable. Find more episodes of this podcast at youarenotyourscarspodcast.com. While you may have been forged by fire, you are free by design.